we are picking back up in Philippians, and now we're going to be talking about working out our own salvation. So as we're coming into this section, remember Paul is talking about the fact that we as Christians should not be scoping out our own things. We should actually be looking at things that relate to other Christians. You know, this is caring for other Christians. It's seeking the best for other Christians. It's not just looking at how it benefits us uh, and ourselves. And then he's also talking about, or previously he'd also talked about the fact that we are to have a proper frame of mind, not only towards each other, but especially towards God. And he gives us a good example of this proper frame of mind. It's the same frame of mind that Christ had when he came. Remember, Christ is actually God in the flesh. He is the second person of the Godhead. He, he took his outward form, or he emptied himself of his outward form of deity, and he took on the form of a servant. But in doing that, he did that so that he would be obedient to the will of the Father because he was fulfilling that. And our frame of mind really should be in our lives to be doing the will of the Father. What does God want us as Christians to be doing right now? He wants us to be living out who we are in Christ. You know, we can understand the desirous will of God because it's very clearly shown in Scripture enough of his desires for us to actually put it, in, you know, put our minds to work properly and use them so we can discern any situation and actually know it. And that should be our focus. And now Paul is going to talk about working out our salvation. This is in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12, where it says, So then, my beloved, just as always you have obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, with fear and trembling, you for yourselves work out your salvation. So he starts out with this concept of being obedient. And it's really, of course, important for us as Christians to be obedient to what God has said. And to be obedient literally means to listen under. So you're paying attention, you're listening to what is actually being said. We see different examples of how this impacts our lives in different um, situations, such as like with the sin nature. See, over in Romans chapter 6 and verse 16, we have the concept of listening to the sin nature. That is obedience to the sin nature. So over here in Romans chapter 6 and verse 16, it says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey? Now again, that word obey, obey is to listen under. You are that one slave whom you obey. Whether of sin, now in the context, it's talking about the sin nature. And of course, the sin nature is going to lead to death. That's what it produces. It doesn't produce anything that's of any value to us. Or obedience, now obedience leads to righteousness, a manifestation of the righteousness that we have in Christ. And that's what it would be talking about there. We also have the fact over in Romans chapter 6 and verse 17 that the doctrine of victory over the sin nature actually, of course, gives us victory over the sin nature. Romans chapter 6 and verse 17 talks about this. But thanks be to God that through that though you were slaves of the sin, now in the context again is referring to the sin nature, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Now, of course, the doctrine term here is talking about information that we are to learn and put into practice. It's how to have victory over your sin nature. No reckon and yield and being obedient to it. We, we don't use law to overcome the sin nature. If we're using law to try to come over this to overcome the sin nature, we're not being obedient. And that's not what it's talking about. It's through obedience out from the heart. And of course, remember the heart is the center of us. And this is center of the of the person before we're actually even committing the sins, we can have victory over it when we're properly applying the defense that we have against it. There are going to be those who do not obey the gospel at all. And the result of that, of course, is going to be a appropriate punishment for their refusal to obey the gospel. 
Romans chapter 10 and verse 16 is one example of this. And here over in Romans 10, 16, it says, but they have not obeyed the gospel for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Now in the context, of course, he's talking about the fact that salvation is comes through faith. It doesn't come through works. Starting out in Romans chapter 10, he's dealing with Israel. And what was Israel's problem? Why did Israel not find the righteousness she sought? Because she sought her own righteousness. She wasn't seeking God's righteousness. So when the righteousness came through Christ, Israel wasn't seeking that. And they missed it. But the Gentiles saw it. And they understood it. And yeah, there were many who didn't respond in a way you would have expected. You know, sometimes it's amazing to, to you have the truth. You have things that are, it is reality. This is the way things are. An example of this is you, somebody struggling with life and, and just not really, not having a, a situation, well, I'm kind of thinking of somebody who is just having a general difficult time in life. They can never seem to do anything right. They act like God doesn't really love them. You know, their, their focus, their Christian life is just a mess. And it has to do with the fact that the person is not taking God at their word. You know, and then you share that information with them and they don't respond in a way you would have expected. Or somebody who has a miserable life who isn't saved and you give them the gospel, incredible information about the fact that God actually has saved us. But they would rather just ignore that and go on and live in, you know, good example. Of this is somebody who believes in evolution. It's absurd to believe in evolution, but they're going to believe in that rather than actual facts because they're more comfortable with that and they're going to live in misery. You know, oftentimes when the prophets came to Israel, the prophets were off, they were bringing good news in some aspect, you know, they were rebuking Israel and others, but the end result, if Israel had listened, would have been what? Beneficial for Israel every single time. But yet, like with Isaiah, he brings a message and he's like, there's no, nobody's actually believing me. Now that wasn't entirely true. He wasn't seeing all of them and God ex explained that to him. So again, like with Isaiah, it should be something that we should be encouraged with. Because the reality is that even though we don't see the impact of it, God knows the impact of our actions. So living out who we are in Christ, even though we're in a situation where it may not seem like we're impacting anybody, the reality is we could be impacting a lot more people than we think. We should be obeying God regardless, though. Second Thessalonians also talks about this. Those who will not believe, well, they won't obey. Now here is talking in flame, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to face punishment because they don't believe the gospel. They don't obey it more specifically. And what is obeying the gospel of the Christ? Or in this case, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It starts out with believing that Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again on the third day. You have to believe that. And if you're going to reject that as having no value, you're not obeying that gospel, and the end result is going to be judgment. Those who do not obey Scripture, we also see over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 14. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle... Note that person and do not keep company with them that he may be ashamed. See, there's some who are going to ignore scripture. They're not going to listen to the letters that were written by Paul and by the other apostles, okay, by the Old Testament saints, by the prophets. Those things, they're not going to listen to them. And we should be paying attention. They're not going to obey. They're not going to listen under. This is the kind of person who's going to breathe things that are false. We should not only 
not paying, well, we, we should note these people, but we shouldn't even keep company with them. And of course, the end result, especially if it's a Christian, is to get them to do what? Correct the way that they're thinking so that they can actually properly fellowship with us. Because if we're fellowshipping with God, can we fellowship with a saint who is not um, speaking the truth? We can't, can we? It's the same thing with us. Can we fellowship with God if we're walking in the darkness? We can't. We have to be walking in the light. It's the same way. It's calling them out for their actions. Yeah. Their obedience to the gospel of D. Christ was not just when Paul was around them. And he's pointing that out. This is important. So they obeyed. They responded. But it didn't just end when Paul left. It's not like, okay, well, what Paul was saying was all good, but let's go back to the law. They weren't doing that. They were being obedient to the gospel. And as a result of that, Paul is going to encourage them to continue on to work out their own salvation. And then, of course, he talks about working out that salvation with fear and trembling. You know, this fear and trembling concept is from, really, it's a result of having a proper mindset towards what God has given us in salvation, and is about not desiring to displease him. That's what it's talking about with fear and trembling here. You know, we need to understand that fear is not talking about the losing of one's salvation in this content context. In the context Paul, there's no question about whether or not you're going to actually be saved. You are. So he's not referring to that when he's saying work out your own salvation. Now we see a reference to this, fear that is, not being something that as a Christian, fear isn't a part of our, our life. Fear that is of punishment. Mature love casts out fear. So how can then fear be a part of the Christian life when the Christian life really the sole focus on the light is properly expressing love. What well, is our commandment? Love one another as I have loved you. That's our focus. So this fear in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 18, this fear is being punished. The fear of punishment. That is not a fear that we as Christians should actually have. We respect who God is and what he has done. That's the fear and trembling he's talking about here in the working out of our salvation. Now, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 18, like I said, this is not actually referring to a fear in the sense of being afraid of punishment. There is no fear in love, but perfect or mature love casts out fear because fear involves torment. And actually that word torment there would be better to translate as punishment. Because that's really what it's focusing on. But he who fears has not been made mature in love. So as we grow and we mature in love, we are not going to have fear of punishment. But that doesn't mean we lose our respect for who God is or for what God has done in salvation. It's actually pretty incredible. And it is a very fearful thing when you understand the incredible things that God did in salvation. He took us out of Adam. He placed us into Christ. He changed every aspect of our life. He actually made it so that we can live out a life of righteousness because he placed his seed in us. We should be, we should have a proper respect for what he has done. And we certainly do not want to displease him. So with that attitude, we then want to be working on our own salvation. Now the working out of your own salvation it, this working out is talking about that which is produced from a situation or effort. That's what it's talking about when it's referring to one who is working something out. So we're going to work something out in our salvation, or in this case, it would be salvation in the way that we're actually living. A few examples of how this working out is used in scripture, we see like faith working out patience. Over in James chapter 1 and verse 3 talks about this. Over in James chapter 1 and verse 3, it says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Well, your word produced there literally is your word to work out. 
So that's how it's actually producing it. So the testing here it's talking about is uh, testing for, in this case, it's kind of um, more along the lines of testing for approval. And that's kind of important to understand because your faith isn't being tested to see if you'll fail. Your faith is being tested to see what quality it is. Now, if it fails, what does that mean? That means you're not taking God at his word. That means your faith, the ones that's coming out of your mouth, really is not result of actually what you believe. You're just saying it. But if you're actually believing what God says, faith is going to work out patience. Why? Patience is a dealing with circumstance. You're going to understand God's going to deal with the situation. And I don't need to be concerned about things that I can't change anyway. How often do people get so strung up and, and just strung out about really realities in life that they can't change? And they're not paying attention to what God is actually doing. And then when you're in that kind of a mindset, are you living out who you are in Christ? Probably not. Because you're not trusting in God. What about if you get a temptation and, you know, a temptation to sin? What happens if you sin? What does that mean? It means you weren't taking God at his word. Well, how does that work out? How were you dealing with the sin nature? Did you identify where the desire was coming from? You know, how many Christians don't understand how to simply identify where the desire for sin is coming from? It can come from the sin nature, it can come from Satan, or it can come from the world system. And they all three attack us in completely different ways. <clears throat> Satan wants to get you to lie. Sin nature could care less about lie. It wants other things. The world system, that's the pride of life, the biological pride of life, the, the lust of the eyes and the desires of the flesh. That's where it focuses on. We have to put on the proper defense. And if we're not putting on the proper defense and we're failing, it's because we're not taking God at his word. It's not that God's word doesn't work. We want to be taking God at his word. The wrath of man does not work out the righteousness of God. In your working out term here. Our wrath is not something that is going to produce God's quality of righteousness. It doesn't work that way. James chapter 1 and verse 22, or verse 20. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Now, your word produce there, of course, is your same word for working out. And it's for any quality of man's wrath or the wrath of humans doesn't work out a quality of God's wrath, or excuse me, of God's righteousness. It's a quality of man's wrath that does not work out a quality of God's righteousness. There's no righteousness, um, no God quality of righteousness in our wrath. The working out of the will of the Gentiles is something that we as prior to being saved used to do all the time. First Peter chapter four and verse three talks about this. In first Peter chapter four and verse three, it says, for we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. Now, what is the will of the Gentiles? It goes on to explain it. Walking in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, rivalries, drinking parties, uh, um, idolatries, and so forth and so on. Those kinds of things relate to the Gentiles. When God was dealing with Israel, what did he allow the Gentiles to do? He allowed them to go wherever they wanted, go the way that they chose. And they went into some pretty perverted ways. Those are the ways of the Gentiles. We as Christians should no longer be working out those desires. They're not our desires anymore. And we need to reject them. We also have the working out of the sin nature. And we as Christians, of course, don't want to do this. This is over in Romans chapter 1 and verse uh, 27, where it says, Likewise also, men leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, 
men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty, their error, which was due. In the context, what's going on is mankind has chosen to reject God. Knowing God, they chose to reject him. And in their rejection, they were, they were allowed to be darkened in their minds. Thinking they, they themselves were wise, they actually became very foolish. Even to the point of changing the natural use of a woman. Where, and of course, the end result was they're going to actually reap the consequences of that. Now, it talks about penalty here. And penalty is the fight. Is the, I think it's a good way to express this. But literally, penalty means the wage that you earned for what you did. So they're going to earn properly what they actually, the, the wage that they earn from producing works of the flesh and being obedient or working out the sin nature. We as Christians don't want to be a part of that anymore. That's not a part of our lives. You know that law works out wrath. Law does not work out righteousness. You know, again, this is an important thing for us as Christians to understand because we don't live by law, we live by grace. Romans chapter 4 and verse 15 says, because the law brings out or works out wrath. That's what it produces. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. And they do a good job of translating this one. Because remember, a lot of times in our translations, they, they really fail us in, in mixing up words. They, they'll mix up the word sin, transgression, and trespass. And it gets really confusing for us. Because there's three completely different things. A trespass happens in the mind. That's when you decide to do something that you know is contrary to God's expectation of you. You've made a determination that you're going to do it when the opportunity comes about. You've trespassed. You've stepped into an area you don't belong. Sin is when you actually perform it. Now, a Christian can sin, but a Christian cannot transgress because transgression is a specific type of sin that requires a law. The Eve transgressed. Israel transgressed. A Christian can't transgress because we're not under law. But the reality is what law actually produces is wrath. It doesn't produce righteousness. The sin nature works out all kinds of desires in our lives. Its desires. It wants to work those desires out. And it can get a little frustrating in the way that it works those desires out. And we see this in Romans chapter 7. And as you're going down in th through Romans chapter 7, you really see the frustration that Paul is having with dealing with the sin nature. But sin, here in Romans chapter 7 and verse 8 it starts, but sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desires. And this word evil desires here is actually your word for, uh, I do believe it's bad desires. Let me jump over here real quick to pick that up because evil, of course, can mean a couple of different things and we want to understand what it's actually referring to. So it's all manner of, worked out in me, all manner of, really, it's actually doesn't use the word evil there. It just says desires. Through the commandment in me, worked out all kinds of desires. And so it's not specifically referring to evil desires here. It's, of course, desires that relate to probably working out, well, in the context, Paul is trying to live by law, and he's finding out he can't actually produce that. And as soon as he applies a law to himself, what does he do? He, he shows this as an example with covetousness. Thou shalt not covet. What do I start doing? I start coveting. But that doesn't make sense, because thou shalt not. That should work. But in the end, all these desires start coming as a result of applying this law to him. That's what he's talking about here. Producing in me all kinds of desires for apart from the law, sin is dead. Sin has no strength where there is no law. 
Now, this is something that I think if Christians would just understand, even at the very basic level, we do not abide by the Ten Commandments. We have a greater standard. Our standard is to love one another. And if we would love one another, we would have freedom from that law that comes as a result of, the, of trying to live by the sin nature that always produces death. It always produces a miserable Christian life. He goes on and he talks about the struggle again, that if you're going to put law on, on it, what, what does law really do? It manifests the sin nature for exactly what it is. And then he talks about that. For what I do here in Romans chapter 7, verse uh, 15, for what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I do, for what I will, that is, I desire to do, that I do not practice, but what I hate, that is, I'm indifferent to, that I do. We've all dealt with that struggle. We don't want to do things that we know are sinful, but yet we end up doing them. Sometimes it's after the fact where we realize that we just did it again and we didn't, we don't want to do this. Why do we keep doing it? because we're not taking God at his word. And we actually have a part of us that seeks to produce those things and we need to properly overcome it. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. He's talking about the sin nature and the desires that the sin nature has. It is producing in me. Verse 18, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. There's nothing good there. And he's talking about his sin nature. For to will is present with me, but to perform what is good, I don't find. Not within myself. Verse 20 goes on and says, Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. And now what he's talking about is the distinction between the new nature that we have in Christ the old nature, which related to the sin nature and who we were in Adam, and the individual, the person, who we are as an individual. Do we, or are we obedient to God, or are we obedient to the sin nature? And the struggle that we find in our own flesh, that the reality is in our flesh we can't produce righteousness from it. Now, the sin nature, by the way, oftentimes when we think of sin nature, you know, you always put a negative connotation on that, and it, it does produce bad things, but it can try to look good. Religious superstitious awe tries to look good. It's a person who goes to church all the time, who helps the poor, who does all these other things, but they're not really doing it for the right reason. Their focus is on the flesh. And then the end result is they still end up sinning and, and living a life that is just miserable for a Christian because they're not, they're really not having victory over their sin nature. They're not having victory over Satan or the world system. It's just tossing them around like nothing. Because again, they're not taking God at his word. Godly sorrow works out repentance. Now remember your word repentance is a change of mind. And you see this over in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10. For godly sorrow produces repentance. Now, of course, that producing repentance is, um, the produce is actually a word that means to work out. Repent means to change the mind. It's really important to, to focus on that. And it, it's a repentance unto salvation. That's a godly grief. Sadly, a human's grief leads somebody to really take their own life. But a godly grief should lead you to proper repentance, the changing of the mind, to understand what God has actually done. It's producing that. Working out the whole armor of God in defense against an attack from Satan is really important for us as Christians. Working it out, using it. When Satan attacks us, we shouldn't cry out to God for help. He's already provided everything we need to actually overcome him. We need to actually take God at his word and apply it. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 13. 
therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Now you're having done all would be and having worked out all stand. Now here it's talking about the malignantly evil day. What is the malignantly evil day? It's the day in which Satan attacks you. Now, why is it a malignantly evil day? Because he wants to take his wickedness and spread it to you. What is his primary sin that Satan actually did? It was independence from God. And he wants us to act independent from God. He wants us to be discouraged, to be disappointed, to be bitter. So that, you know, we have the attitude, well, if God won't give it to me, I'll go take it for myself. And that's a completely wrong attitude for a Christian to have. And if you don't believe me, read over in Isaiah what exactly happened to Lucifer when he actually tried to do that. It didn't work out so well for him. When he decided he was going to put his throne above where God is at up into the third heaven and he was going to ascend above the clouds the end result was he lost his kingdom and god flooded this earth didn't work out for him at all when satan attacks us we need to put on the whole armor of god and remember the armor of god is a mental process where we're going back through the things that relate to our salvation if Satan wants to attack you and say that you're not righteous before Christ or before God, you can you should be coming back and saying, yeah, I'm righteous in Christ, and there's absolutely nothing you can do about that. I am righteous. And since I am righteous, how should my actions actually be? Well, I mean, my actions should be righteous because I am righteous and start rejecting him. So we as Christians need to work out our salvation. And of course, the working out of our salvation is actually using our salvation. So we're not earning it. Now, you can see how this word working out is actually used in Scripture. It's not talking about something that you earn to gain something. It's talking about working something out that you have. We can work out the sin nature or we can work out righteousness. And we should, as Christians, be working out our salvation. We need to do this, of course, for ourselves. No one else can actually do this for us, by the way. You, nobody else can produce your, the benefits of your salvation in you except you. You can't work it out. I, as a pastor, can instruct you on how to do it. In some cases, God even allows me to show by example how to do it, but you have to actually do it. Now, we're not alone in this. Don't think, you know, it's all by ourselves. The Holy Spirit is the one who helps us abide in Christ. And our abiding in Christ, when we're abiding in Christ, what's the end result of that? We start to produce fruit. We start to produce righteousness. We have victory over the sin nature. We have victory over Satan, and we have victory over the world system. And we start living out who we are in Christ. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 27 talks about this. But the anointing which you have received, now in the context, the anointing he's talking about is the Holy Spirit. So the anointing which you receive from him abides in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. Now, it would be completely ridiculous, and I know there are some people out there who want to say, well, I don't need a pastor. Well, then why did God actually give to the church pastors and teachers? Understand in the context what he's saying, because it's actually right here in the context as to why you don't need a teacher. So, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone should teach you. But as that same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie. And just as he has taught you, all things is referring to you abide in him. He is going to teach us how to abide in Christ in all of the different situations in our lives. That's the Holy Spirit with us. So we're not working out our salvation by ourselves. 
we're using what God has actually provided for us. And the Holy Spirit is right there along with us to help us to understand how to properly apply it in any situation we face. We're not doing what is pleasing men, but God. You know, and the reality is sometimes that means we're going to face persecution. But we should face that persecution if we're willing to do what is right. It's knowing how to overcome your enemies and using the proper defense. You know, that's so important for us in our Christian life to understand that part of our Christian life is the ability to actually overcome the sin nature. That part of us that wants to do those things that are bad, that we're constantly struggling with because, we're, again, we're, we're, we have these desires that we know are completely against God, and we don't want these desires. We don't even want these thoughts in our minds. But if you don't understand how to overcome it, well, what does it lead to? A very frustrating Christian life. Because what you're going to do is go from one principle of law to another principle of law. And you're going to find out that none of them really work. None of them give you victory over the sin nature. Oh, for a little while, you might have some relief because you'll force yourself to accept, you know, that I've got to do this or I've got to do that. But the end result will always be the same. The sin nature will always have victory over you. But if you take God at his word, it's so interesting when it comes to fighting the sin nature. You don't fight it. You do the things that are right, and the sin nature loses strength. And that's what Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 6 and 7 and 8. How, where you frame your mind, how you live out your Christian life. It's not, it's not about grabbing your bootstraps and pulling real hard and making yourself do it. It's about living out who you are in Christ. What about Satan? Satan is a pretty fierce enemy, but the reality is when you put on the armor of God, what is his response? He leaves. He's, he's not going there because he knows once you put that armor on, he is not going to defeat you period. There's nothing he can do. And he's, he's not going to keep pounding on you because it's just going to make you stronger. So he's going to leave. He's going to wait for you to actually put down your defenses. Oh, what about the really sneaky one, the world system? Why do I call it really sneaky? Because what is the intent of the world system, the purpose of it? It's actually to rock you to sleep like a little baby. So sometimes you find yourself, well, falling asleep, and not paying attention to your Christian life, but you're getting caught up in the things that relate to the world. The lust of the eyes, the desires of the flesh, the pride of biological life. And I've talked about this before, the absurdity of somebody thinking that they're better than another person because of the color of their skin, because of where they came from, because of the language they speak, because of whatever. We are all humans. The only thing that matters is our character. It's the only thing that has ever mattered. But the world system doesn't want you to believe that. Because a world system is Satan's design so that he can control unbelievers. We as Christians don't want to be controlled by that. We want to pay attention. It's working out our own salvation. Know and do the desirous will of God in your life. This is something that should be basic to all of us as Christians, is at least understanding how to discern God's desires will in our life. And we don't go put a fleece out on the lawn and, and make that a decision, because that was Old Testament. And what I mean by that is we're not looking for a sign. God has given us everything we need to understand what his desires will in, his, in our life for any situation we face. We need to know it, learn it, understand it. This is the basics. Know and live out who you are in Christ. This is what we're here for right now. This is our purpose. Our purpose isn't to be somebody great in the world system. Our purpose is just simply to live out who we are in Christ. 
If we live out who we are in Christ and God presents us before millions of people, then so be it. If he presents us before a couple, so be it. That's not our focus. Our focus is living out who we are in Christ every single day. Because it's an incredible life that he's actually given us. Now, 1 John chapter 2 and verse uh, 7, uh, 27, like I said, that's the one that's specifically talking about the fact that we're not doing this by ourselves. The Holy Spirit is actually with us. So the working out of your own salvation is not about you doing self-effort. It's about you using what you have in salvation and producing it. And we also see, of course, the very next verse is the fact that God is the one who is working in us to even desire to do these things. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13. For God is the one working in you also to desire and to work out the good pleasure. So we have both of those aspects that God is actually doing in us. Listening and obeying to the desires that come from God. That is what we as Christians should be doing. James chapter 4 and verse 15 talks about this. And it says, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and we shall do this. Now, in the context, what he's talking about is if we know what to do is good, what good to do, which is the desirous will of God. That's our, our focus. If we know it and we decide to do our own desires, we're actually sinning. Now, why are we sinning? Because we're saying, God, I know what you expect of me, but I'm going to go do my own thing. Now, in this case, he's talking about we're going to go to such and such a city and we're going to earn some money. We're going to stay there for a little while. We're going to come back wealthy. But we know it's not really God's desire as well for me. Well, how would I know that? Well, I'm going to go into a place where there's no good Christians around. Nobody I can fellowship with. You know, there's no church that I can go to where I'm going to learn the truth and, and be taught properly. Oh, there's a few churches around and they kind of, you know, they're not really that good, but it's okay. No, it's not okay. That's not God's desire as well. We shouldn't be doing that as Christians. We should be listening to what God's desires are for our life. Sometimes we have to suffer for doing what is right. And that's something we also need to keep in mind. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 17 talks about this. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil, for doing things that are wrong. Now, in the context, he's talking about people who are speaking bad about you. They don't like you because you won't participate in their wickedness. You're not going to go out and you're not going to drink with people after work. You're not going to be involved with things that you know are inappropriate and completely wrong. And they don't like that. So they're going to persecute you in that way. People, you know, they said they're going to speak false things about you. They're going to reject you because uh, you don't want to be involved in their wickedness. God's desires are in contrast to the desires of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 17 talks about this. Now, this, of course, is important for a Christian to understand. We do not hear God's voice. We don't hear a, 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 a quiet, still voice in our head to tell us what to do. God actually indwells us. Understand what that means. We have three parts. We have a body, we have a soul, and we have a spirit. Each of those three parts of us gives us desires. We're just talking about the sin nature. Where does the sin nature come from? It dwells in your flesh. It actually produces desires to you as a person to get you to do these things that it wants to do. Your soul is your emotional center. That's going to be where it's focusing on really things that make you feel good. And then your spirit is more of your rational side. You know, your rational side is probably going to be the side that says, hey, maybe, you know, yeah, it feels good. But in the end, it usually doesn't work out very well. So maybe we shouldn't do that. Maybe we should have one less scoop of ice cream because, you know, it's rational. You know, we have those three parts. 
Well, now that we have the Spirit indwelling us, we actually get desires from the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And those desires that are produced in us to do the things that are right, they are in complete contrast to the desires of the flesh. The desires of the flesh say, let's do this. Well, the desires of the Spirit say, no, let's do what's right. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 17, for the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the spirit against the, the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things which you desire. And it's talking about the producing of uh, the sin nature. We don't want to produce that. Listening to him will result, of course, in a rejection of the desires of the sin nature, of the flesh. We're going to completely reject those, and we should as Christians. That's so important for us as Christians to do. We cannot serve the flesh and serve God. You cannot serve God through the flesh. Romans chapter 7 is so clear on that. You can't use the flesh to serve God. It doesn't work. A mind that is set on the flesh is hostile towards God. Romans chapter 8. But a mind that is set on the spirit, now that's a, a mind that's going to produce the things of the spirit. Now, sadly, there are some malignantly evil men and swindlers around us that are going to get worse and worse. And that's not something that should, should scare us from working out our salvation. Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse uh, 13 talks about this. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Yeah, sometimes we have to suffer for doing what is right. But don't, don't get involved with people as they, they get worse and worse, and they're going to get worse and worse. We need to continue to learn who we are in Christ and stay in that word that we have learned. We need to continue in that. Second Timothy chapter, two, uh, chapter 3 and verse 14 talks about this. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. Sticking with what God has actually done. We need to work out our own salvation. We need to use it. We need to be doing the things that please God, not men. You know, focusing on that. These are the things that God considers to be good. Not man, but God considers them to be good. That's where our focus should be as Christians. Those in Christ are placed as sons. Perhaps we should start acting accordingly. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5 talks about this. Having predestined, now he didn't predestine anybody, by the way, and this isn't really a good word for predestined, because predestined means something completely different. Let's actually translate this correctly, because it's literally your word meaning horizon, so if you have a horizon, what are you doing? You're marking off the bounds. So really he's saying, having marked off the bounds of us to the placement of sons, adoption of sons is almost a silly translation because it literally means the placement of sons and it has nothing to do with adoption. Are we adopted into God's family? First John very clearly states that his seed is placed in us. We're not adopted children, we actually are children. It's not talking about our adoption. It's talking about our position before him. What is the position of a son? A son is no longer under governors and tutors. Galatians chapter 4. Governors and tutors are what? Law. We're not under law. Why is the son no longer under governors and tutors? Because the son has sufficiently learned to properly manage the household after having been under them for so long to where he gets to the point to where he's now mature. Christ sees us all as being mature ones. So having marked off our bounds to the placement of sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasures of his desire as well. Again, we as Christians should start acting like that. Working out our salvation. 
working out our salvation, not earning salvation, it's using salvation. That's so important for us to understand. And the reality is we are not doing this by ourselves. We need to start paying attention to the desires that we have within us to actually do what is right, to do the righteous things. Not only paying attention to them, but begin to actually apply them to our lives. And the other desires, when they come up, we need to put on the proper defense against them. If the sin nature wants you to do something, you should understand what are those desires and how do I overcome them? When Satan wants to bring some stuff against you and he wants to make you, well, he might, he wants to get you to act independent from God, but he might use discouragement, disappointment, lying, all these other things. You need to reject him, put on the armor. When the world system wants to come along and get you to not pay attention to living out who you are in Christ, because there's just all these so many shiny, lovely things for the world system, but no, they don't have anything to do with who you are in Christ. They, they change your focus so you're chasing a dream that isn't, well, it's just a made up dream to keep your mind off of who you are in Christ. We need to be rejecting that and we need to be listening to and obeying what God actually desires. And in doing that, we actually will work out the salvation he's given to us.